Johnny, you kept sign you kept signing autographs. You kept partying. Did you feel those things helped you? I mean, did you feel that you could that you functioned and you played better while doing those things? Okay, that's a great question. That's a really good question because at that point in time in my life, I felt like the harder I partied, the better that I played. How? My freshman year. Tuesdays and Thursdays were Tuesdays were beer with the baseball boys at the house playing games, and Thursdays were hitting Northgate, going to the town. Drunk as you could get with all the dogs. Friday was the walkthrough. I go to the walkthrough at 10 a.m. in the morning, dying. Smelling like a liquor store. Like a liquor store. <laughs> and then I would go through that walkthrough, and you can ask anybody that was on that team, and I hit those walkthroughs hard. Right. Hand in the fake, I'm taking off down the sideline for 20, 30 yards, running back. I'm sweating it out. You try to sweat it out. Oh, yeah. Then we get on the plane. Right. <laughs> Get to the hotel, meetings, this is the system, and we're winning. Right. Now we're 11 and 2. We'd beat Bama, and this whole year is Tuesday, Thursday, bang, bang, all week, every time, like clockwork, every game of the season that year. And I'm getting better as it goes on. I ain't losing a step until that first offseason in 2013. That's when I'm starting to smoke more weed. That's when I'm partying a lot more. And then from there, I'm not taking care of myself in the way that I did the year before to go be special. And my numbers, my second year, totally were better. We're better. That's what I needed to do. At that point in time, I needed to get you guys or whoever it was on first take or this and that talking in the right direction that this is, these are my, you know, this guy went back and did better, better. than he, year, he did the year before. Mm -hmm. So therefore, what is the next step? The next step is the league, the show. The big thing. And that's where I was at in my life. I felt like I did enough from, okay. I was living my life at that point in time to appease what other people expected from me or wanted from me. I wasn't living really in the right way. I mean, obviously I wasn't, but like I was there to like tell people what they wanted to hear and like had these people around me. This is how you need to carry yourself. And in that I lost who I was. And when you lose who you are, you resort to other things in your life to numb that pain or to find yourself. And in that, I found smoking weed. In that, I found partying. And that kind of took over from there, 2013 on. Uh, you know, there's no reason. There's no reason other than exactly what my behavior was 2013 on why 2014 and 15 in Cleveland didn't work out. It's no secret that I was doing the same thing on a Thursday night in Cleveland that I had been doing for the Thursday night in College Station. Number one, because I'm the backup. I just got handed all this money and I'm not taking it seriously enough because I don't know how to be a professional. I have no idea. Now I get thrown into this organization with the head coach that wants nothing to do with me from the day that I get there. With the defensive staff that our first day of offensive install, day one, they're running six DBs on the field in practice. I can't even point a fucking mic. I ain't never taken a snap under center. But Jimmy O'Neill or whatever and Mike Patton are going to come out to the field and throw fucking eight DBs on the field the first day of an install? Talk about your confidence getting busted quick. Now I feel like I can't do what I was great at in Cleveland. And I'm partying and doing what I right. thought made me great. So you see how all these things are compounding together to equal a huge disaster. You didn't feel you could do in Cleveland what you had been great at at Texas A&M? Not at all. I had no, for no confidence. You went to Heisman as a freshman. You come back your sophomore year, and you have some issues. We start the season off with, well, it's reported that Johnny Manziel signed five, 4,000 items and this and that. Allegedly. Allegedly. Allegedly, Johnny signed 4,000 items for free. So... I, Johnny, you you got you. Why put yourself in that situation where it could be allegedly? I got a head on my shoulders, man. I'm smart enough to know what's going around me. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing the money fly around me. Right. I'm like I'm not walking through that same bookstore watching those number two jerseys fly off the shelf. Break me off. Where am I cut? <laughs> <laughs> it's everywhere else for right. everybody else. Yes. I got $700 a month coming in on stipend. 
That ain't enough for me to do what you I want to do. You need seven bands a month coming in, huh? I need 70 bands. 70 bands? Yeah, come on. Seven? 70? How the hell am I going to travel to Miami with seven bands? <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing with seven bands here? I need 70. Wow. Let me ask you this. Let's just say for the sake of argument, when Johnny Manziel, his Heisman Trophy season and the season after, the NIL is in existence. How much Johnny? How much Johnny football get? Probably ten million a year. I could have done five on my own with the Instagram. I could have done five million a year on my own just through the people and connections I had on my phone. Right. That's what a lot of people don't understand is during this time and during this rise, and a lot of where my downfall probably came from is, you know, I get on my phone and get on Twitter and be like, "Yo, Shannon Sharp just followed me." Come on, James Harden, Drake, LeBron. And you partying with him. I'm in a, I'm a DM away from being Rockets courtside. I'll be there in an hour and a half. My access that I had to the world and people that I wanted to be around was limitless with just my cell phone in a, in a house in College Station. Had Johnny Manziel been a little bit more discreet you probably still could have got that 10. But because IG and you posted it, you at Live and you at all, all these places with the stars, they're like, man, ain't no way in hell no college athlete has that kind of access unless he getting broke off. My family's rich. Yeah. And so is that, and see, you play to it because you could use that, you know, Johnny doing that. Man, Johnny wouldn't take no money. His family rich. Well, little did they know Johnny ain't worth $50 million like being reported. Correct. So, I wasn't discreet at that point in my life. Not at all. I wasn't exactly. calculated. I wasn't precise in how I was moving. I was 19 years old. Right. I ain't, I don't know nothing about the real way of the world. Right. I don't know nothing about what happens in Miami. Right. I'm a young, naive kid out here trying to get a bag on my own. Right. I don't know nothing. And I can't tell my parents. I can't tell my coaches. I don't got nobody to bounce this information off of, you know, uh, and I'm, this is the point where I start like reclusing to myself and like big problem in my life, Shannon, has been, I wake up every day for the last 10, 12 years and do exactly as I please and exactly as I want every single day. And as I'm moving forward in my life right now, I believe that as a man in life to humble yourself and to be able to get to where you want to go. You have to do things that don't you don't want to do. Right. You have to do things that make you uncomfortable. You can't just wake up and go down this path of la di da. I'm gonna do everything as I please in that moment of time. That's gonna make you soft. That's gonna make you. You got all these things that come with that. In my opinion, mm -hmm. if you go out and put yourself in uncomfortable situations, if you go out and work hard for what you want, which isn't the most glorified way all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not fun to go work hard and put your time and your effort into something, especially something you may not really love truly deep down to your core. So, you know, what I've learned in life is, you know, make yourself uncomfortable. Do things that you don't want to do to help others. You know, be selfless. Mm -hmm. Find a way to give back more than just thinking about yourself. And I'm sitting here today saying at 19 years old, I was only about self. You know, that first year as a, as a, my Heisman year, there was a, a lot less of that. I had my camaraderie with the team. I, I was a leader. I was there for my dogs. And then as that shifts, I became a bad teammate. I became a bad role model. I became a bad example for what a Texas A&M university football player should be and an ambassador for my school at that point in time. And I still to this day hold a lot of shame about things that I did from 19 to 27, 28 years old. Shame, Shannon, to where I couldn't sleep at night, to where I went into the LA and the Hollywood Hills and I hid, hid from everybody except the TMZ cameras in the middle of the night. And that for me is taken a decade to come to terms with what happened in my life and what I did to myself. Because at the end of the day, I don't have anybody to blame but myself. My mom and dad didn't raise me to be that. And Coach Sumlin or Coach Kingsbury or any of those guys at Texas A&M didn't raise me to be that way. My teammates sure as hell didn't push me down that path of being there. So why did it happen? 
You know, those are the questions that have taken me a decade to find out what makes me who I am and ex coming to terms and accepting who I am. The good, okay, great. That's awesome. That's unequivocally me. The bad, okay, let's find out and identify what that is and be better bit by bit, day by day to ensure that what happened in the past Never ain't going to happen again moving forward. If Johnny Football persona had never been created, do you still go down that path? Yeah, I do, without a doubt. From that day in Kerrville, you know, from getting to there and being that guy and like getting a rise out of it and getting notoriety and people coming around you, it's uh, fame is a... It's a drug, it's addictive. Oh, it's a high. It's, you chase the dragon <laughs> of fame, man. You chase the dragon of clout and... Um, it is very, very addictive, and right. it is a problem that I dealt with in my life. And if you would have asked me in 2014 or 15, I'd have been like, nah. Right. Because for a long time, I didn't see myself as the true level of fame of what I really was. Who damned you out for those those uh, uh, that autograph signing? Somebody damned you out. Somebody got stuck with a lot of merch, a lot of stuff that they couldn't sell. And then from there, they got stuck with maybe like $20,000 worth of product. And the compliance department was cracking down on indie autographs that were on eBay and this and that. So they lost their avenue of how to get rid of their product. Right. And they got stuck. And the guy went to the University of Texas, was in Houston. He blew the whistle and then it all started to crumble down and it happened quick. If you'd have had somebody behind the scenes working because Texas A&M is those boosters, they they want what you gave them. You gave them a Heisman Trophy. You almost led them to a national, you know, a, a, a national championship. If you'd have had somebody working behind the scenes to say, "Look, let's keep this kid happy. This is all it's going to take." Because you mentioned your dad. You said Kev, told Kevin Sumlin you didn't know anything about this for three mil. That's a drop in the bucket, considering that you could have made ten. So I'd say, like, for five million, he'll stay. Won't ever say a word about this. And you say, Kevin, some look at him like, bro, we're going to keep this train rolling without Johnny. I needed Cliff. I needed Kingsbury for that situation to go in a perfect way. So you needed Cliff to be your offensive coordinator because he had, he left. I needed Cliff to be my offensive coordinator. And I needed Cliff to be that role model in my life when I got too out of whack. Because that first year, my freshman redshirt, my Heisman year, I was skirting the line yeah, a little bit. Yeah, you were starting bit. to. But every time I started to get here, he went, pull you back. Every focus, time. Focus, focus. And I looked him. From that day he came on that high school field to come look at me and tell me he couldn't offer me. I had a trust with him and a bond with him that I still have to this day. And when he left, the fuck, it sucked. I'm looking at this. They say they sold 45 million number two Texas A&M Adidas jersey. Maybe 45 million in revenue. 45 million, a lot of jerseys. Texas, well, okay, 45. And so if they'd have gave you, say, here, Johnny, uh, we're going to give you 5%. I'll take 10. Damn, Johnny, 5% <laughs> is more better than what you get. You're right, you're right, you're right. Okay, five, five. But when you see, when you see Texas ADM making 45 million in jersey sales and Johnny Manziel getting $700, million, $700 in a stipend, that doesn't sit right with you, does it? It didn't. So you start concocting a way how you can get how you can get some of that pie. Exactly. I got my pie. But you knew you knew that it was wrong. You knew that you could get yourself in trouble and potentially the university. But at that point in time, what? Yes. Um, I knew that it was against the rules. Okay. I know that I'm putting myself in a position that may not work out well for me or my university. But at that time, once again, going back to selfish Johnny Manziel, mm -hmm. you know, I'm thinking about how to get that. I'm trying how do I get that stipend bumped up type of like, I'm thinking about the money at this point. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't expect myself, even after winning the Heisman Trophy, to be able to go get drafted. I didn't know if that was a sure thing to go to the NFL draft yeah. or be able to make any money. So I know what I needed then. I needed more money. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with that money that I got as well, you know, I, I took care of my dogs in the locker room. You know in a big college locker room, there's dudes in there that sending half their stipend or all their stipend back home, and they're taking six to-go boxes out of the 
athletic facility. Mm -hmm. They go into the apartment and there's no lights on. You see, and this is what I see, people come from all different walks of life that walk into these locker rooms. Yes. They don't come from Kerrville, Texas, from the suburbs all the time. Yeah. They come from the trenches. Yes. And I bond with people that come from nothing. Me and Mike Evans like this. He's from Galveston, Texas, born on the island. It is no joke down there. Where he's from is a different way of life. And like I've seen because of the sport that I played, how all these people come in from different walks of life. Mm -hmm. And it's not as peachy as you think it may be. It's, it's not all rainbows and butterflies out there for some of these kids that come in and mm -hmm. it's tough. And I took care of my dogs. Right. Uh, all this money didn't just go to me. A lot of it did. But if my boys needed something, they got it. And if I wasn't there, that club, that tab at the club was picked up. Always. Did your parents know you was getting this money? Oh, yeah. Because you breaking them off too, huh? Mm -mm. You ain't, hold on. You ain't, how you ain't break mom and dad off? Mom and dad are doing fine. <laughs> mom and dad are living at the biggest golf course in town. Dad's got his best job he's ever had. Right. What you want? You Did want you help him get the job? No. My dad's independent on his own to right. be able to go do that. I'm sure my name and what was going on, of course, might have helped it. But, you know, I was finding out and it was like hard to just be like, what do you do with this cash? You know, what? Oh, I can't well, you gotta book, book a flight. How you gonna go somewhere? Like, what do you do with how do you check into a hotel? How you do this? So it was like You have any credit cards? You ain't getting no credit cards, Johnny? I ain't know nothing about a credit card until I got to Cleveland, Ohio. I don't know nothing. I would go buy uh American Express gift cards for a thousand bucks in cash and right. then have that. And then I gotta keep track of how much is on every balance and stuff. Right. And I'm going through Amex gift cards like this going out of style. Right. So I didn't know anything about a credit card. I didn't know anything about credit. Nothing. I'm looking at, <laughs> I read this, it's like, the rumor was you came from oil money. Did you have oil money? My uh, great grandpa, when they came over to, from Lebanon, they founded, found, you know, oil in East Texas. And right. it very much was, you know, my family um, was very, very big. So my grandpa, he had like six brothers and sisters. They hit this huge oil well. So when I'm growing up, I don't even realize that we have a farm in Tyler with a runway and a hangar in the back and all this stuff. I didn't even really know what it was. My uh, my grandpa, because of what my great grandpa had done, they had the opportunity to be boys, boys, mm -hmm. right? Take the planes. They were big into boxing. So like Jack Dempsey was a huge like family friend of theirs. You know, they tell me stories about going on these hunts with Mickey Mantle and Joe right. DiMaggio and all these guys. And I've seen the pictures, like it's as real as it gets. So you have this like, what you saw from me and the lifestyle that I was living, I think was like minorly ingrained in me for what I saw as a kid and what they were doing in the 50s, 60s, 70s. So it wasn't a far reach for you to like, to have what you have because your family did have money. So it wasn't a stretch for you to be flying private and doing all that stuff because your family came from money. So you could pass it off. Uh, my dad gave me this or my family gave me this. And so this it wouldn't even bat an eye. How could they prove it? They couldn't because you, you, you had, I just, hold on. Your dad said, well, in 2013, he said, it's not Garth books money, but it's a lot of money. <laughs> and I don't even know the full detail of it, right? Like right. I got, you know, from 18 years old, I'm thrust onto the spotlight. Now I have my own life that like I'm living that's like separate from that like family stuff. It's not as cohesive anymore, right? The fame and everything that comes with with what happened to me will break a family apart very, right. very quick. Mm -hmm. Who are we going to the game with? Who gets these tickets? It's all about the clout and on all this stuff. So we as a family were tested and tried throughout this rise as well. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a me thing. And that's what I didn't realize until I got cut in Cleveland. And I and I was a couple years removed from that. And I remember thinking and hearing from my mom, like, you don't know how hard it is for us to walk into a restaurant in East Texas. We're dealing with the ramifications of your actions that are going on every day. So when you're going out here acting like an asshole, I gotta walk into my grocery store and get treated like one. And why is that fair to your father and I? And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Is that where the change came? 
because because you saw the toll not only with I mean I don't know maybe the, you're the last person to see the toll that is taken on you but when you hear your mom tell you the tell the toll that is taken on them because of your actions and they shouldn't have to suffer for what you're doing to yourself it's a start that was the start of it okay. it definitely wasn't definitely wasn't the like final thing that got me to the point of what I'm being able to do and sit here with you today. I think that's a complete uh, understanding and self-awareness of oneself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, without a doubt, wholeheartedly know myself and what I've done good, what I've done bad. I'm the only one that knows the truth that I've seen through my eyes about everything. So when I got to the point where I'm completely detailed and honest about every situation and what went into it and why I may have done that, that's a continuous like evolution of a person that takes longer than five years, you know? And I don't think I'm a finished product right now. I just think I'm onto something mentally that is clicking with me, allowing me to be the person I think I should have been. Want to join Club Shay Shay? Become an official member by hitting that subscribe button where you never know who's going to be joining us for drinks and conversation. Don't be late to the party because you know we like to do something before two something.